Hi, I am here today with the OG of Quantum Consciousness, <laughs> together with Brent Rose, Stuart Hammerer. <laughs> Hello, Suzanne. Hey. Great to be with yeah. you. Good to see you. We're having a really nice time here in yeah. Florida. How do you feel quantum consciousness is going like nowadays? Is it a more people getting interested in it? Are people losing interest? How's it, how's it going? Oh, I think it's definitely growing. We've kind of uh, evolved past the brain is too warm, wet and noisy baloney we used to hear. Uh, as you know, it, the brain is 70% water, but the other 30% includes oily nonpolar regions of aromatic mm -hmm rings much like the psychedelics and that's where the quantum stuff happens and i know that because that's where anesthesia acts and anesthesia acts only by quantum interactions and only affects consciousness primarily so uh it has to be there and you've been studying anesthesia and the effect of anesthetics for decades now i guess in fact i went into anesthesia largely to study consciousness i was in medical school i liked the brain mind problem i thought about neurology neurosurgery psychiatry but I fixated on the microtubules, which pulled, seemed to know where to go and what to do, seemed to have some kind of intelligence or consciousness. And at that time, microtubules were also discovered to be in neurons. Neurons were full of them. Their structure was shown to be a lattice, something like a computer. So I got the idea they might be processing information. So anyway, I went out to uh, Arizona and uh, met the chairman of the anesthesia department. He said, if you want to understand consciousness, figure out how anesthesia works. Says, we don't have a clue. And he said, uh, and he handed me a paper by a friend of his in England who uh, had shown that halothane, an anesthetic, depolymerized microtubules in a tiny organism called uh, actinospherium. And it was, uh, it was in Lancet as a theory of consciousness that anesthesia caused your microtubules to depolymerize. Well, it turns out it takes about five times the amount of anesthesia right. to depolymerize as it does to put you to sleep. But it does show that anesthesia acts on microtubules. So when they depolymerize, that's bad. That's bad for our uh, brain tissue, right? It's yeah, yeah. In fact, that's that's what happens in Alzheimer's. I mean, there's these amyloid plaques, but they don't really affect the uh, cognition too much. But inside the neurons, the microtubules disassemble. There's a pro microtubule associated protein called tau mm -hmm. that is on the surface of the microtubule and does two things. It stabilizes the microtubules and it acts as a coding mechanism mm -hmm. to tell the motor proteins that are walking along where to get off and, and for synaptic plasticity if they're nearby the synapse that happens to need more whatever they're carrying. So uh, I, he, so I knew anesthesia had something to do with uh, uh, microtubules and uh, I could study consciousness. And then he said, it's a lot of fun, you'll make good money. And I said, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I had an interesting question. It's a little technical, but it's something that's really been bugging me. So I know you mentioned that you can actually anesthetize plants. Yeah. So the question is, you also said that only the microtubules in neurons are aligned in the right way. So how does that reconcile? Oh, yeah. So you're asking whether plants have uh, microtubules in, in uh, multi, uh, yes. multipolar yeah. networks. Yeah. I don't know that. That's a very good question. Um, but uh, I didn't do that work. It was done by a friend of mine, Rajneesh Khanna, at uh, Carnegie Institute in, at Stanford, a uh, plant research place. And uh, it turns out that, you know, like when a sunflower turns to follow the sun or the Venus flytrap eats whatever it's eating, um, that action is, is controlled by microtubules. And as far as the sunflower turning, it's controlled by microtubules at the junction of the uh, root and the stem, one particular area. And in another set of experiments, we, we detected megahertz oscillations, which, which come from microtubules, only in, in the plant, only at the uh, stem root area. Right. So, oh, um, so maybe they are aligned down there. Well, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe plants, they don't have to be. I think they can process information, maybe have work of our events mm -hmm. uh, without, uh, without being multipolar, without being these anti-parallel networks. But it's a good question. Yeah. Well, I'll ask uh, my plant. Plant and friends. Similarly, I always wondered about like the paramecia with covered in oh, little hairs, and these are also microtubules. The cilia, yeah, yeah. So they, their ores and their sensors that uh, stick out are cilia, which have nine pairs of microtubules and a central pair. And this, and they're about 150 nanometers in diameter, and they can be of various lengths, but they're found throughout biology. We have them in our cells, they're part of our centrioles in every cell, including the primary cilia in neurons. And uh, they're in our gut, they're in our lungs, they're everywhere, and they're all, all throughout biology. And uh, they must be doing something important. <laughs> yeah, those they steer those guys around. So. They do, and also they're uh, they're super radiant, as uh, Philip Currian has shown, and the tryptophan networks in the centrioles in particular. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of the uh, the headquarters of the quantum stuff going on. Excellent. Yeah. So I guess you and I agree on like quantum consciousness being interesting or OR being interesting, but maybe where we disagree is I'm trying to test things with quantum computers. Right. 
that exist today. And the question is, are those quantum computers really good enough? Are they replicating OR type events? What do you think? Uh, I have to say no. And, uh, but I think what you're doing is essential towards, I mean, if you have a quantum computer, how do you hook it up to uh, a robot or a human or whatever you're going to do with it? And uh, in fact, somebody at this meeting mentioned Paul Benioff. So he was one of the uh, three guys credited with, with uh, uh, inventing quantum computer with uh, Feynman and David Deutsch. And uh, uh, he wrote a, when Roger Penrose and I were trying to figure out how we could have the quantum state and also interact with the environment for input and output. Uh, Roger mentioned, you know, uh, Paul Benioff wrote a sci-fi uh, story about a quantum robot and it, it oscillated between quantum and classical phases. Yes. I said, I think I've heard of this story and now I'm like, I have to read that. Yeah. <laughs> so I said, that's perfect. It does its quantum business and then it collapses to classical, gives the output, uh, runs the show, uh, neuro, uh, axons fire, uh, you, you do your behavior and then it goes back again. You start the quantum superposition and so it's an oscillation. So therefore, there has to be a frequency. So what is the, you know, and that's what we've been looking for, the yeah, frequencies. Really and we found them. Yeah. In fact, I, I'm hoping that in the future, if our quantum computers today aren't good enough, we can actually use these experiments to inform how we should build special purpose quantum chips of the future to maybe encode or core. Yes, I've thought about that a lot. Uh, I think it may be possible. Uh, one way would be fullerenes, like nanotubes, because they're aromatic, and they have uh, quantum optical effects. And I kind of think maybe microtubules are somehow in some weird way emulating uh, uh, carbon nanotubes that were in the early universe. Uh, they come from young stars. They're still being formed, actually. So uh, there's some connection there that we're looking into. Maybe carbon nanotubes were life's first attempt at microtubules. At something. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, or, they became, or they became conscious. Yeah. They could have had, started having orca wire events, uh, and, and there's a lot of poly, polyaromatic uh, hydrocarbons in the universe. Uh, they're made by young stars. I look, I'm, I'm in astrobiology now with Dante Loretta, as you know, and this is what we're looking for. We're looking for aromatic uh, uh, mo molecules from, uh, from an asteroid, Bennu, that, that Dante sent this NASA probe to and brought back all this organic material that we're studying and looking for signs of life and consciousness, because we suspect that consciousness came first. Yes, yeah, that's super interesting. And I hear Anurban's also building a microtubule quantum computer. Anurban is, is, is funded by the Indian government and at this place called IIT, the Indian Institute of Technology in Mandi, which is up in the Himalayas. It's right. a really cool place. I've been there a couple of times. And uh, he's building a, uh, a self-organizing, warm temperature, organic quantum computer based on uh, this brain jelly he invented that is uh, kind of a complex of organic rings uh, mm -hmm. and that forms a helical uh, a spiral where, where the oscillators are lined up. So the aromatic rings are the oscillators. So he, he told me the key is that you have, you have helical oscillators and then it just starts oscillating and it just kind of can compute that way and you just have to interface with it. So that's what they're trying to do. Yeah, I'm trying to think of ways to make superconducting helical coils <laughs> to make those kind of qubits. Uh, yeah, well, uh, you can just grow them instead of making yeah. them. Yeah, that's true. That's yeah. true. Yeah. So you've got the um, science of consciousness this year happening yeah. in Barcelona. How's the preparation? You'll be going? there. Yeah, I'm going to be there. It's going pretty well, actually. We got about 400 uh, abstract submissions. And uh, Barcelona is a great town. I don't know if you, have you been there? I have not been to Barcelona. Okay. No. Well, it's famous for uh, one particular architect, uh, Gaudi, right. and he uh, he built this incredible 144 years it took. It just uh, it just got finished this year or last year, uh, Sagrada Familia. And I've been I've been going to Barcelona since 1968 when I was a college student. By then, it was over 100 years, and now it's finished mm -hmm. and it's magnificent. When we wanted a logo for the conference, and what if Gaudi made a building shaped like a brain? Yeah. My uh, Barcelona collaborator and contact, Javi Ganesta, fed the idea to uh, ChatGPT mm -hmm. and uh, we came up with our logo, yeah. Gaudi's Brain, we call it. Cool. And are you seeing more abstracts being submitted around the area of quantum consciousness? Well, or? yeah, a big, a big theme for this conference was, is consciousness fundamental? Like with a hyphen, fundamental. fundamental. And by the way, David Chalmers claims he used that term first and maybe he did, I don't know, but he doesn't, he doesn't practice what he preaches. So <laughs> anyway, um, uh, so we, we have uh, several sessions, plenary sessions, and then several a number of uh, uh, submitted abstracts on that. And uh, uh, so, yeah, that's a theme, but, but also quantum. So that's we, more panpsychism and well, it's, idealism. 
Good question. It's not idealism because idealism says that consciousness is everything or everything is right, consciousness, right. which is what Christoph Kolk has come around to after mm. turning mystical. And it's also what Deepak Chopra says. Yes. But uh, and then you have the material that just says, you know, everything's material and consciousness just doesn't matter. Uh, our view, my view anyway, is that you, ha you do have reality, you have classical reality, and you have quantum reality, and consciousness actually exists on the edge between the two. And I, I've often used the, the yin-yang for this with consciousness, the S-shaped uh, boundary between the two, because whether consciousness collapses the, uh, the wave function uh, or the other way around, it works. And I, we think that uh, collapse occurs spontaneously due to the uh, fine scale jump to the universe and that causes consciousness. Mm, yeah. So either way, there's both classical reality and there's quantum world and consciousness quite literally, as it says, somebody gave me this line from the Kabbalah years ago, consciousness dances on the edge between the two worlds. And that's kind of what it does. That's interesting. Yeah, we see a lot of effects happening at the phase boundaries. Yes, the boundaries, surfaces, exactly, yeah. exactly. Awesome, well, I'm looking forward to the conference and I hope you are too. <laughs> Start working on your zombie blues line. You yeah, know about that? Yeah, we, yeah, you mentioned that. We have to uh, write a... Uh, go ahead and explain it. Let's see if we can... Verse. <laughs> so it was um, inspired by David Chalmers' idea of the philosophical zombie. And a philosophical zombie has no experience, no subjectivity, no feelings. So it's kind of an oxymoron of a zombie experiencing the blues. Exactly. Very well put. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thanks, Stuart. Okay, Suzanne. Awesome. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to Spain. Thank you.